Good morning, good evening, good night, NBN Entrepreneurship and Leadership. Personally, I'm fascinated by the story. Trust is an underrated weapon in the business landscape. I'm a really, really strong believer in learning by doing. What's the definition of success? You're trying to come up with an answer to the question. But go ahead, Richard. Uh, you could be right, but you're wrong. <laughs> good evening, good morning, good night, NBN Entrepreneurship and Leadership Channel listeners. It's a great pleasure, along with Kim and my co-host, to mel- welcome Michael Blakey onto the show this evening, who's in Singapore. I would introduce Michael for his glittering uh, career in the United States, Europe, and Asia, but I think you'll do a better job if you do it yourself, Michael. So why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, well, thank you very much both for having me. Uh, really honoured, uh, very excited uh, to be here uh, talking to you both. Uh, so yes, yeah, so um, I guess very briefly my uh, background, uh, I was, I guess some people would call it an entrepreneur, um, I just, just call it survival, uh, um, uh, uh, worked, worked in both the US and the UK and then I started up a little business with my brother which we then sold and uh, it wasn't in anything technology or anything related to that, it was uh, in property. Um, and then the dot-com boom was happening. Uh, I was in London. And there was a lots of excitement around. Um, I tried working for the corporate uh, and just realized that uh, it, it, a nine-to-five job was definitely not something for me. Uh, and I got a chance to work at uh, Sainsbury's to you, uh, which was food delivery back in, back in the very early days. Um, and I caught the bug. I believe that the internet was going to change the world and the way that things were being done. Um, and my brother, uh, Simon, came to me one day and said, look, we should get involved in technology. It's, it's going to change the world. Uh, neither of us knew much about it. Um, uh, so let's, uh, and we've been introduced to EIS and the tax breaks for it. And having made a little bit of money, we thought, okay. So Sorry, what's, actually- uh, what's EIS? So it's, uh, oh, Richie, what's it called? Um, Enterprise Investment Scheme. It's a tax break. So it's the reason in that in the UK, you have the most active early stage investors in the world. So um, basically, you can deduct from your income the amount you invest, and then you don't pay capital gains. On what you, so you get a tax break on the way in and a tax break on the way out. Would be a fair way to summarize it? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it, your, your downside is protected. So if you invest, uh, I might get the numbers slightly wrong, but it was literally if you invested £100,000 into a startup and it went belly up, uh, you would a- actually only lose about £50,000. Um, but if you turn that 100000 into £100 million, you would pay zero tax on it. Oh, my goodness. So That is a pretty good uh, deal. So, so and, and there's actually something called SEIS, which is even more generous than that, but that came in later. Um but it's, it's the reason why so many people in the UK actually invest in startups because the limit that the the limited downside uh, is there for investors and obviously being quite a high tax regime, um, if you do make it good, you actually get to keep the money yourself. So interesting. Uh, I wonder why Silicon Valley isn't in London then. <laughs> Ah, well, you could, there's many, there's many ways I could. I, I, th- I think, I think bef- before you answer that question, um, um, so, so basically, uh, just sort of filling, filling the gaps. So, ju- so you, you, you had a fund in a fund in London, and now you've got a fund in Singapore. Maybe you should like talk about how old you are, because you said, you know, the dot com bubble, and maybe people don't know which one you're referring to. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this was. Uh, so I became, I guess, a full time angel investor back in 2000, January the first of 2000. Easy date for me to remember. Um, so it, it was the, the first one, um, and I set up, it wasn't actually fun. I was, it, it was, uh, my brother and I as our own funds, uh, we decided that we would invest in, in kind of online digital companies, um, that it actually took us to until 2007, which I would say that we did our first digital investment. We got sidetracked along the way. I think our first investment was into robotics company. Uh, then we invested into a telco, uh, into a, a cosmetics company, uh, logistics. So um, uh, I think group space is what I would f- probably call the first pure kind of internet play that we did. Um, that was in 2007 into kind of two 
two students from Oxford University. So they, they were still in, in, in university at the time, or one of them was. Um, so, um, and then in 2013, um, I moved to Singapore, uh, carried on angel investing out here. And then in 2016, set up what became Cocoon Capital, which is an early stage seed fund uh, investing across the region, I would say in deep tech and enterprise tech uh, businesses. I've kind of overflown. It's not your traditional VC and how we invested wasn't your tradition, isn't your traditional way, but I guess that's a, something we can delve into later. But I've been, the, the idea when I started with my brother was that we would only invest for a couple of years and then we would do our own startup. We thought sometimes the best thing to do was actually invest, uh, learn from others, uh, and then kind of try and do it ourselves. And um, and how's that? Started. How's that? How's that going? Twenty years later. <laughs> Twenty years later, I, I've kind of given up the idea of actually ever starting a proper tech business myself. Uh, I always thought uh, uh, I. I think the doctors said that when I was much younger, I, I have like dyslexia. So schooling wasn't ever very, I wasn't very good at it. And uh, the doctors used to say I have very low attention span. I'm easily distracted. Um, and so one of the great things for me as an early stage investor, I've been doing it for, I think, 21 years. And I don't think I've had two days, which are even close to being the same. So okay, nice. every day, uh, is different. Every company I see, every founder is different. Every time I think I've seen all the problems that could ever befit a startup, uh, a new one comes along, which I would never have expected to see. Um, and the thing that I actually love, and, and the re one day, even though we've had success, we've never really looked to move away from the startup, because I know more the traditional route from an investor is you start at seed and then you kind of move up to series A. Um, I'm always excited. I've uh, even as uh, when I was doing my own startups, I always enjoyed the thing of getting the product market fit, solving the problem, finding the problems, kind of getting that kind, maybe not completing it, but seeing kind of, okay, I know I can get it done. And then I wanted to move on to my next thing. And I think for, for me that working at the seed stage is, is, is being able to do that, helping founders actually, uh, kind of solve the problem, like build the team, get started, find that product market fit. Um, can I, I, can I, can thing... I, can I ask you, because I'm, I'm so curious, like, so how did you get, so I, I want to go back like to your yeah. whatever. So, I mean, you're English and you grew up, yeah. uh, can, if you can just talk just a bit, because like, I, I'm always fascinated with like how you started out and then like how you ended, and you said you, I guess you struggled at school if you said you had dyslexia. So like, how, how did you get from, from the, the first part of your life from growing up to actually, I guess, to 2000, basically, how did you get to that point that you even had money and that you were, and you invested, you said you had a business, you had a property business. Maybe talk a little bit about the early, the early days. I think the early days, I think if I, I was very lucky. My parents uh, always felt that education was the, the most important thing to, for success. Uh, growing up, so I got sent to a, I got sent to a prep school and then a boarding school. So pretty much from the age of six, seven, I was uh, kind of away from home, um, and always struggled, always struggled, and always struggled. And, and you describe yourself as very lucky. That just doesn't does that not sound strange? As you say, it? you're very lucky. You were sent away, and you were always struggling. And didn't they realise? <laughs> But I, I think I, I'm always somebody who looks at the silver lining. Uh, if, if I don't think I would have survived this long, um, if if I always got worried about you know what could have been. I you know I always look at it like getting sent away so young. I never actually realised there was a different way of growing up. You know, if I've actually kind of you know gone when I'm 13, 14 to a boarding school, um, or I would have left home when I was you know going to university for the first time. It would have kind of seemed strange because you're leaving something that you've got that tight knit bond of the family. Um, and for me, kind of like six years, still don't actually know what's going on. And you're kind of like right. sent to sent school, and you're just kind of like, yeah, no, it's I, you know. And I think I had, I think for a long time, you know, you always feel like, oh, my parents don't really care about me. But kind of looking back at it as like an adult, I looked at it and said, well, actually, 
I was amazingly lucky. I had this amazing education and my parents gave me all these opportunities for a kid to be able to like travel and do things. Um, and I struggled hugely in the early days at school. Um, and then um, my parents were obviously worried about it. So they got me, and I, I came back, uh, they got me tested uh, for many, many things. Uh, and it came back that I was uh, severely dyslexic. Mm. Um, and so, and, and, and a lot of being dyslexia, obviously it makes, you know, especially the traditional uh, education system is not really set up to, to help and work with the people who are struggling with dyslexia. But I think the biggest thing that dyslexia does is that you know you know these things, but you just it just doesn't come out the way that you want and things just get very jumbled. Um, and it destroys your confidence. So, um, uh, so they tried to help me as much as possible and support me through that and made sure that I got as much help as possible. But for me, if I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't be where I was today um, because I consistently failed at everything that I tried to do. Um, be it an exam, be it kind of anything, especially on the education, on the work, you know, and it, it, it knocks me quite a bit. But I have this philosophy is that kids nowadays, you're not allowed to fail. It's like parents want to modicolor you so much. You get a participation and, and, trophy. <laughs> You know, well, you can't have sports days anymore because somebody might lose the race and they might be, you know, psychologically scarred. Right. Um, you know, if I didn't win a race or I was big into it, so I, I kind of channeled my energies through sports and doing other stuff rather than, than studying. Um, and, you know, my dad had a very simple philosophy, you know, if you don't get you what you want, just try harder. Um, and I think, you know, when you're being... I would, say I would call myself more of an investor now than ever really an entrepreneur. Um, if I worried about all the bad investments and bad decisions that I made, um, I would have stopped doing this many, many years ago. It's, it's a very brutal kind of industry. It's very similar with, I, 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 I think it's very similar to setting up your own company. I mean, because, yeah. you know, entrepreneurs, I mean, you know this better than anybody. If you're de in particular, you're dealing with young and experienced entrepreneurs. You see people making mistakes left, right, and center, and that, that's part of the process is making mistakes. Um, so basically, you didn't. So what I'm hearing is you, the dyslexia and the struggles actually gave you resilience. Basically, it sounds like it gave you resilience. And yeah, just... and it taught taught me to always like. I think the most important thing it taught me is that mistakes are fine as long as you make them only once. So yes. I always used to reflect in terms of what could I learn from how I did something? What, you know, what could I have done better? How can I improve? Even and when you're a teenager, even when you're, sorry to interrupt, but even when you're a teenager and uh, high school you, you, uh, or uh, prep school, you, would, yeah, you had that I, philosophy or that was once you, you left school and stuff? I think it's the, I think it was, I didn't, I couldn't, if, if you asked me as a kind of 10 year old kid, could I put this into words? No. I think looking back at it, uh, you know, in my 30s and 40s, I can, I can actually see that's what it taught me. Um, and, you know, it, but you don't, when you're going through it, you don't really kind of understand that that's what, that, that's kind of the life lessons you're, you're learning at that point in time. But, you know, kind of when I was kind of going, going, you know, especially in the early days of investing when I was really trying to figure out what the hell I was doing and, you know, obviously made a few bad investments. I was like, okay, actually, um, the, fa the fear of failure didn't stop me from doing something. My grandfather always said that anybody who tells you that they've never had a failure uh, is somebody who's never taken a risk. That's, that's, a, that's true for sure. So how did you go? So but do you, you, you went through school. I mean, even though you struggled, I mean, you actually went all the way through. I mean, you went to college yeah, and everything. I went, yeah. I mean, f for me, I, I always just managed to, through, I think it's, I, I made my own way through school. I mean, even to the sense that when I went to university, I made up my own degree. Um, so I kind of learned from an early stage how to make the system work for me. Okay. You know, most people, when they go through university or they go through school, there's a way that you do it. I was like, I know what the end goal is. I know the route that everybody else takes doesn't work for me. So how can I kind of hodgepodge things together to make it so I can just 
get to the end. You know, I didn't really care about what the, the grades were or what the results were. I was just like, I've just got, that's the goal that right. I set myself. That's interesting. Um, that's interesting how, how you did that. Um, and Richard and I often talk on this podcast about education. Richard yeah. went to Cambridge. I went to yeah. a college in, in the US. Uh, and um, we have a little bit of, I, I think sometimes we have a varying differing views on education and how important yeah. it is. But what's interesting about your story, so because I, I, so I mean, my question is basically going to be like, how important do you think education is? for an entrepreneur. But um, before before you answer that, I, I just wonder how you, uh, you know, it seems in your case, like I'm seeing a little bit of a different story here. You actually, because of your uh, basically learning disability, school gave you sort of a, a, a it was a, it was a, it was like a survival <laughs> course or survival <laughs> camp, basically yeah. that, that, that maybe other people don't get from school. So it actually gave you something else. It gave you like a, but anyway, well, I, yeah, that, just if you can just a couple words about that, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, literally, I mean, even like, I was the kid at school that if you, you needed somebody to sell you candy, or God forbid, well, actually, I was kicked out of school in the end for selling alcohol. So it's for any of these, I was always the guy who was like, how can I make some money? How can I, uh, you know, again, as I said, going, going against the grain, but just getting through the system, how can I kind of and, and where did that where did that come from where did that how can i make some money come from do you, was it like your parents didn't give you much money so you were sort of like you wanted to keep up with these rich private school kids or was it something else i, I for me it was again it I, it wasn't about really the, the money it was actually like in some ways beating the system in terms of and as education itself like book learning never really had to uh was 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 that important to me um i was thought well kids want kids want kind of at the beginning you know, prep school was like candy at, at boarding school it was alcohol i said like, actually i could make some good money and, and as a kid you know you make it and you, you know you then spend it and have a good time um and for me that was kind of i you know i never called myself like an entrepreneur in that sense because it was more kind of, but again, I guess, again, it taught me a lot of things, which I, I guess, you know, school does it. For me, school was like, you know, if somebody could teach me how to actually balance books, you know, when people talk about, you know, your, your margins and your cogs and all of these things, when you're trying to sell alcohol and you're trying to do it on the scale that I was, you've actually got to teach yourself this stuff. So if, if you say, okay, you've got to learn maths, I would have been like absolutely irrelevant to me. Um, but actually what? when you're trying to think of logistics, so one of my favorite kind of sectors to invest in, I love logistics and trust me, when you're trying to like get sweets into school or you're trying to get alcohol into school, you kind of have to figure out some quite interesting ways of doing it. And, um, again, it was just something that for me was, I guess, fun. And it gave me something to actually go for, which I felt felt was useful for me did you do, uh, do you remember what your margins were on the alcohol and the sweets sweets no i've got to say i don't at that that young age i don't think i was there but i know for my margin was 100 percent on alcohol hmm. I, would, I would buy I, I you know this is back in the days so you could buy a a bottle of vodka smirnoff or whatever for about 10 pounds god knows what it costs now and i would sell it for 20 <laughs> um you know and you know, it, it was, you know, but I'm still trying to figure out years later is that I must have made a lot of money. But I still haven't figured out where the hell it went. I must have, you know, it, it, it's- You had a good time. Kind of, you, had, you had a good time. I, I did some entrepreneurial yeah. stuff in college as well. And I also yeah. just blew it on the yeah. party, basically. I, you exactly. probably, you were the party. First of all, you <laughs> were the party. Let's be honest, you probably, were the party. Yeah. You were the guy everybody wanted to be friends with because you yeah. had all the booze. Maybe yeah. maybe, maybe half the vodka went in CU and half the <laughs> half the vodka yeah. went went to the customers. <laughs> My friends still tell me that. And I think then the interesting thing for me was, and this is something which is, I've always been a big picture guy. So if I look at all the people that I've worked with successfully, both my brother and, and Will Klipke now, they sadly have to deal with the mess that I normally make is because I have these big plans, these big ideas. But again, devil is in the detail, as they always say. Um, so I think the first time I learned that sometimes actually reading the small print is a good idea 
was, I think I was 16 years old um, and I needed to get out of the house. I didn't want to go like get school. I was like, fine, but going home, uh, not the best of uh, atmospheres. And it was more because I was a teenager than I think to do with my parents. Um, and I got offered the job and I was like, really excited about it. Uh, it was for the whole summer. Um, I thought, great, I can move up to London uh, and I'm going to have an absolutely wicked time. Um, then I got a phone call from the school. The school, the housemaster came into our dormitory and was like, you know, Michael, your parents on the phone, they're quite worried. And I think in my whole career, this is the one time they actually called up the school to talk to me. <laughs> so I go in there and I'm like, what's up? And they're, my parents, uh, and I swear they did this on purpose. So my initials are MR, Blakey. So obviously my dad said, so I accidentally opened up your post because I thought it said Mr. Blakey. Um, and he said, so why are you going to the US? And I'm like, what do you mean? Am I going to the US? I didn't know this. Why do you think I'm going to the US? And they said, well, your ticket's here and everything's here. You know, they say you're starting your, you know, this job in Washington, DC, and they've sorted out your housing and your flights for you. And you'll be leaving on a comment. It, it was like the 8th of July. And I was like, sounds interesting yeah no no i definitely took that job but i thought it was in london but hey and and the thing that i've learned is if you and i guess this is you know any entrepreneur will will agree with this if you overthink things you'll you'll persuade yourself not to do it there's always more it's like for me there's always more reasons not to invest in a company than there are to you know i always say if you find a company that is so perfect you can't find anything wrong with it you've got to run a mile because either um, you're not doing your, you're missing something in due diligence or they're really good liars because every startup, there are red flags, you know, and you've, sure. you've sometimes just got to go for it. You just got to go with your gut feel and just be willing to take that leap of faith. And that was probably my first big leap of faith I took. I just literally went to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, as a 16 year old kid who thought he knew everything. Uh, you know, I went to boarding school. I'm kind of all independent. I don't need my parents. Yeah, that was a bit of a disaster. Um, you know, uh, you know, managed to spend my first payroll in like two weeks, and I was like another two weeks before I was going to get paid next. And I was thinking, I've got no money. How am I going to feed myself? Um, so you didn't start selling alcohol? No, I didn't. Sadly, there. No, I didn't. <laughs> couldn't even get my hands on it. I was sixteen. I was like, I've got to get my hands on alcohol. I've, you know. Um, uh, and then I learned. Uh, you know, so literally for me, and it was, and I actually ended up working there for two years. So every holiday I would just go, I, my parents were like, fine, you can go to school, but if you, hey, if you like to work, knock yourself out. Um, and then I ended up going to an American university um, just because again, uh, I watched Animal House um, and that's what I thought American universities were like. And I did a job over at uh, University of Virginia. You, you, it's a bit of known as a bit of a party school, but it was just, a, yeah, definitely. It was a bit, it was a bit big. I was very used to a very small school. So somebody uh, who I know very well, I kept in contact with, explained to me that the College of William and Mary was exactly the same as UVA, except it was much smaller. And I thought that was good enough for me. I was like, I'll do early application. Um, never actually went there, never read the a brochure or anything i just thought um uh richard you've got to understand uh college william mary is an amazing school lots of history to it but it's famous for being one of the toughest and most conservative schools in america so um yeah, i was House, thinking that as was you not. were saying telling this story uh, so you were saying, misinformed about it being party city like, this is a really yeah, somebody, well, not even party city but it's a very like for guy, somebody that's uh, like the way you're you're, you're at least presenting your <laughs> education yeah. that seemed like a very challenging choice <laughs> no uh no it was as i said <laughs> devil is in the detail never <laughs> really kind of i made it work for me but yeah. it, it's um as i said that a lot of my life has been for me as taking big leaps of faith mm -hmm. and then saying, I'll figure it out when I get to the other side. So, so you, perhaps at this college of William and Mary, you, you were like the kind of rebel and uh, the other kids who had just been sent there by their conservative parents were actually quite keen to rebel. And this, you were their sort of Pied Piper who led them into a, led them into a parallel universe or am I just guessing completely wrong? I, I think, 
guessing, I mean, they, in many ways, they, it was probably the biggest culture shock I've ever had in my entire life. Um, uh, William and Mary is a state university. So most of the students, uh, first time away from home was going there. And most of them were, had never really traveled that much out of the state of Virginia. Of course. Um, I was coming in and as I said, my parents had been amazingly good. I had traveled a lot, seen a lot of the world. And, uh, I, my roommate, so you have to live on campus for the first year was a guy came, uh, named, um, uh, Brian Boyd, uh, one of the guys that has probably most one of the most impactful people in my life. We were roommates, actually ended up for, for three and a half years. Um, and he never really been out. He's from Broadnox, Virginia. Um, don't remember many names, but I always remember that one. Um, never really left the state of Virginia in his life. Big, big black guy, amazingly smart. And um, I remember when I first started talking to him and his family and it was kind of, it took us about four days to realize that neither one of us understood what the other person was saying. <laughs> you know, in the end, it was kind of like, I was like, huh? you was just like, what are you talking about? And it was like, <laughs> and he said, my parents had no clue what you were talking about. And I was like, okay. Uh, many years, like years later, he now says he can understand some, oh, like half of what I actually say. But again, it's, um, I think my whole life has been around just, just go, if, if, if I want to have a go for it, I'll just go for it. And then if it doesn't work out, I go on to the next thing. So you had these micro businesses. When, when's the first time you made some real money? And I don't know what your job was that you, it's an unusual story to get flown over to Washington DC by an American, I mean, just flipping it around. It would be unusual for me to fly an American, to come, a 16 year old to come work here in Poland or for a Brit to go to Singapore. So there was obviously yeah. something unusual going on, but when did you, and maybe you can comment on that, but I'm interested in your first business that actually worked and made you some money. Um. When I say money, more than, more than buying vodka for 10 and selling it for 20. The legal one or the illegal one? No, the, well, but, uh, both. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think the first one uh, where actually um, I used to hold uh, massive kind of warehouse parties at university. So again, it comes down to I, I wanted to, to pay my way through university. Um, I, I wanted to be able to travel. I didn't have the money. Um, uh, Williamsburg itself was a very conservative, uh, is in Williamsburg, which is a very conservative area. Um, and a fun fact is uh, fraternities actually were started at the College of William and Mary. But anyway, it's not a big frat, it's not a big frat place. And they've actually banned most of the kind of, there's no nightclub, or there wasn't when I was there, nightclub in uh, Williamsburg. So you had to either go to Richmond or Norfolk which had some of the highest murder rates in those years. Um, so it's not the safest place to go. So I thought, oh, I'll just find some a warehouse off campus. Uh, a, a friend of mine started it and then she left and I kind of like carried it on and kind of expanded it a little bit. Um, and again, it came down to like logistics, like we would get DJs coming in from out of town, maybe New York, DC. We got the booze. We got the security. I even had a bus to shuttle people to and from the campus. I didn't want anybody drink driving. Um, and this sounds quite know, dangerous. I'll be honest with you. Being an American, uh, the, just from a, 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 my fear would be, I'm totally in favor of all of it. It's just that my fear yeah. would be to get arrested. Like if the police could crack down on that pretty hard, if you got bus, I, I'd be, I don't know what the consequences are if you get busted with something like that, but they might be kind of severe. I don't know. They, they, I think they would have been very severe, but um, it was one of those things where, again, I guess youth has its benefits is you yeah. don't think these things through yeah. and you kind of look back at it many years later and might go, oh my right, God. If somebody, hurt, if somebody got hurt, if somebody got hurt. If somebody got hurt, like... you know, and you try and do all the precautions and you're just like, oh my God, but if I got in a, you know, if I got uh, if I got arrested in a criminal record, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing now, and it would have totally changed the the course of course of my life. But I guess in those days, and I think sometimes you have to have that kind of invincibility, kind of and it's maybe a little bit of arrogance to think I can beat the system. 
but I can. I mean, I, I can, think the I idea can... is crazy. I mean, it's a, it's like so basically that was again an extraordinarily yeah. popular thing. I'm sure that was a very very popular thing. Okay, it was, <laughs> yeah, it, it, may, it may be very popular. I had this whole in the game. This is just my. I think that where it was uh, my naivety and sometimes stupidness. I I had a class at eight o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and um, I'm a morning person, so I would always get up. And I was continually turning up late to my class. So the professor pulls me aside one day and she says, is everything okay, Michael? Like you're really engaged when you're here, but you're always kind of 15 or 20 minutes late. And I said, where, you know, where are you coming from? That do you have a problem getting in? I said, no, I live in DuPont, just on the other side of campus. And she says, well, what time do you leave? And I said, I normally leave to walk over here about 7.15. And she says, but it only takes you 15 or 20 minutes to walk from there to here. Do you stop for breakfast? No, no, no I just, just walk over here. And she was like, well, what route are you taking? And I told her, and he said, but Michael, that only takes you 15 minutes. And I said, yeah, but I'm walking along. And these people, I have no idea who they are, but they seem to know me. They keep on asking me how I'm doing. Like, how are you doing? So I stop <laughs> and I tell them how I'm doing. And then I ask them how they're doing. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, who, where do I know these people from? And she was like, Michael, you know, you don't know them. You know, it's just like, it's just a, a friendly They're kind American. of high vibe. They're friendly. <laughs> they, don't, they don't really care how you're doing. And I was like, oh, no. It's like, but it was funny that after that, even people expected, like they saw me and they expected they were going to have to. Yeah, you were the guy that actually talk. delivered on the how you were doing. <laughs> how they're doing. And I was that crazy. Admittedly, a lot of them thought I was Australian, but I was that crazy Englishman right. um, that would actually stop and actually talk to everybody. So, um, and then I think my first kind of going, which sorry, <laughs> totally getting sidetracked there. Um, kind of, uh, as I said, I did a property business with my brother, um, which was literally doing residential flips. So we just, we had a little bit of startup money and we would just do uh, a cop, you know, uh, get an apartment, literally go in, paint the walls white, wooden floors, a few new doorknobs, and then we would flip it three months later. And again, this was before kind of like Zoopla and right move where you could actually see how much you actually brought the property a uh, few, you know, a few, a year or two months earlier. Um, and it was at a time when the property market was booming, but it was something that didn't really excite me. Uh, and you got enough money to kick that off because, I mean, you know, buying even a cheap apartment somewhere in the States, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars, even if it's already- Was it in the States or was it in back in England? This was back in London. Yeah, by that point in time, uh, I was I was back in London at that point. Uh, I'd uh, yeah, it's a long story why I came back to the to the from, from the US to the UK. But um, yeah, it, it was back in the UK. We we got a little bit of uh, money, got some money from our family who were like, okay, off you go. And uh, nobody could believe I was actually doing anything with my brother because it was we were always fighting growing up as kids. Um, I think one of my greatest claims to claim is I actually broke his neck one time. Um, <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, my brother, my brother swears that it was on purpose. I, I still firmly say that it was a pure accident. Um, and, um, but it was, it was something that I didn't get any pleasure out of because it was kind of very repetitive. So um, you said you sold that business, right? Is that what you said initially? We, you... we just got, we, we got, we got rid of the, the, the portfolio and then we just kind okay, of very okay. much focused on, um, so we and so now we've brought it to 2000 are we back or are we, we are kind we of back? like in 2000 now yeah. and we're kind of you know my brother had worked in kind of uh helped set up sainsbury's bank and then he worked for arthur anderson whilst they were still in arthur anderson um and he wanted to try something different i wanted to try something different we were introduced to kind of this tax break and kind of told about angel investing it's not you know, I think nowadays everybody's heard of angel investing, investing in startup, you know, Dragon's Den, Shark Tank, that's helped a lot. But back in those days, it was it was not something that many people actually kind of talked about. Um, and especially because at that time I was, I, think I was 25 and my brother was 27. Um, and as I said, we, we started investing, we're very lucky. Uh, our second business we invested in, we exited quite quickly and um we made a very nice return on it and i think i mean for me i don't i won't talk to my brother but i think for me i i kind of got a bit of kind of hubris and i thought god this is easy 
Mm. Uh, That's a very dangerous. It's a very dangerous moment, isn't it? The God, this is easy, right? Yeah, yeah, um, and it was enjoyable as well because I was, uh, you know, I was seeing uh, kind of so many things, so you know, so many different ideas, and it was just all exciting. And I was getting involved in, you know, as I said, I never thought I. Would, I think I think cosmetics for many years was the weirdest investment I'd ever made. Um, and then, but recently, a few years ago, I invested in a cricket breeding company in Vietnam. So I think that one trumps the cosmetics company. Um, cricket breeding for why do they breed crickets? For food, for food for protein, food. for food for... protein and fertilizer, okay. um, uh, for animal feed. So it, it's going into a lot of things now. It's the new superfood. Um, <laughs> and it's you know, um, and so for me, it, it's uh, I think what attracted i think if you look at our portfolio in the portfolio i had both in the uk and asia it's quite diverse and i think very early on um i realized that i investing in startups isn't investing in products or really ideas it's investing in people so i very much kind of focused on if i could find people that excited me uh, with their ideas and kind of gave me the confidence that they could actually deliver, that's that's who I was going to back. And then I would look at the problem. Are they solving a real problem? Very rarely did anybody actually have the right solution to the problem. But I had to believe that, you know, A, there was a real problem they were solving and that they, they were the right people to actually solve it. Um, so, but one of the things I also quickly learned is if you're investing in kind of one or two people teams, with great ideas, normally they're phenomenally good on the product side. So they're very good at building something. As I said, 80, 90% of our investments have always been B2B or deep tech. I don't, I've done a bit of consumer, but not a huge amount. And um, um, what my brother and I, and now my partner out here, Will and I have, are, are very good at doing is, um, doing more the business side of a business. So if we could find people that could, you, you know, could solve the problem, what, quite often they weren't commercial enough. So it's very much about doing the personal development of the founders. You know, again, when I first started out, you know, a founder of a business was normally in their mid thirties. Um, now I'm investing. I think the last investment I made out in, in, Singapore, uh, one of the founders was 21 years old. Uh, the company before that, one of the founders was like 23 years old. And all of a sudden, you're giving them half a million, a million dollars, and you're saying, go and build a business. Um, if I find that to, has a tendency to fail, funnily enough. But if you say, look, here's, here's a million dollars, and I'm going to help you, I'm going to help train you to be to, to hire the team around you to become the CEO or the CTO, uh, that has a greater chance of success. Because I believe that they're all bright people, but you know, even people who've studied MBAs are not necessarily the best founders for startups because sometimes you have over paralysis, as I call it. Um, but you can't be a CEO and not actually know what that means. And you can either do it by failure kind of learning by how not doing it but that as a startup when you're raising funding you don't normally have that much time to fail so we kind of come in and we say look we'll help you avoid the basic one-on-one mistakes we'll help develop you as a ceo and richard how you might be a ceo is probably very different to how i would be a ceo i don't think there's one way to be a ceo so we work with the founders to figure out what is the best way for them to be leaders the best way for them to build a team around them. So we kind of do it on a personalized basis. And over the years, um, you know, we've had a huge amount of success by kind of taking that route. So we've only ever invested in about two companies a year. So, so what's again, the strike rate? Like what's the what's the rate of success, would you say? Like what are I mean, you know, Oh, that 50%. sounds very that sounds very high. So fifty so, percent. Yeah. 50%, it, if you look at, ignore the ones that are still alive now. If you look right. at the uh, successful exits versus failures, yes. it's, it's, we're around 50%. Wow. 
And in Asia, that, that would be that would be very high. I mean, I'm not an expert in this space, but that sounds very yeah. high. Yeah, that, that, that is pretty, especially when you're talking actually about exit. Like we've OK, I've been around for 21 years, so I should hopefully yeah. have some exits. Um, yeah. But uh, no, I, I think and I think a lot of it is that we've never had the huge, big kind of I've never invested in something like hop in, which is like four million one day and five point six billion the next. But I don't right. think the type of businesses I'm investing in. I normally say I'm investing in boring businesses. So they're kind of things that are not household names, but have gone on because they're solving real problems. Um, I, I believe in them or on the business, B2B and deep tech side. And are you taking it through to which to like series A? Like when are you, at which point are you actually exiting? Like what's the, your Normally strategy? trade sale, trade, trade sale. sale. I think only twice have I exited as a kind of, you know, I think once I got out of the Series A, okay, um, and another time it was actually a management buyout, so it was a kind of okay. Yeah, for for any listeners who don't know these terms, you can always Google them. A trade sale means selling out to someone in your industry, so you don't go onto the public markets by selling shares on a stock market. And again, if you're interested in entrepreneurship and you don't understand these things, the quickest way to find out is to go to Google and look them up, and you'll educate yourself very fast. So, and but how did you get good at management? I mean, you know, there you are, you're, you're kind of um, sort of two pers- a small management training organization teaching CEOs how to lead based on their personality. Now, that's a, you know, if someone told me they're going to be good at that, I would A, be really impressed and B, with my cynical side, say, well, how the hell do they know? And given your slightly weird, I'm, I'm being deliberately aggressive no. because I, th- I think, like, how the, hell, how the hell did you get good at that? It's an unusual thing to be good at. I think and are you for, good at it? Well, I would hope to think that I'm good at it. Well, I, think, I, I always say my track record, I think, kind of says it. But um, remember, it's like, it's, it's like when you asked me about how did I know these things when I was kind of like 10 years old, um, I wish I was this good and I had this knowledge when I first started out. And I would not say it was never the plan for us to only invest into uh, companies. It was never our, our intention to kind of really work with management teams. It was something that evolved as, as I think kind of our strategy and some of the early mistakes, as I said, we always reflected a lot on um, the mistakes that we made in the early days. So I w- there's a couple of investments that I've made during the, uh, over the years that have a real impact in terms of how I've actually done things. And I think the other thing is, is that whilst I'm an, I've always been an awful student, I've, you know, let's just, let's just not let that, I, I, w- I will never ever do a class again but I love to learn and I love to learn by either trying doing it myself or actually listening to people who've actually gone through it. And so I would always listen and I would always attend every meeting just to try and learn and see how things progress. And I think when you're an active investor, if you're getting so involved and sometimes active investor does not necessarily mean you have to be talking and guiding the whole time. Sometimes it could just be watching and learning. And I've, I've been amazingly lucky that in the early days, we work with some amazing angel investors who have been doing it for many years before us. And I think, I don't know if they, maybe I'm being a, a bit silly, but I feel sometimes I feel a bit sorry for us um, because we were so much younger. I mean, we were still in our early, early 20s or mid 20s. The, the next kind of, early stage investor probably in the youth was probably in their mid forties. You know, this was back again, remember we're back in the, the you know, um, kind of 2000s here. So it was not normal to have young people. And a lot of people were like, okay, are you looking for your parents or you're an entrepreneur, you need to be in the other room. Um, so, uh, you know, I, a, lot of, a lot of this stuff we kind of learned over the years and it wasn't kind of until much later that we actually realized this is actually what we were doing and what we were good at. And my brother had had a lot more experience. So in terms of, especially on the finance side and the strategy side, Simon, I think from his time at the consultancy, um, had learned a lot. I think my time at uh, working in a startup, you know, I definitely saw how not to do things. Um, There were some quite spectacular I can't believe that they did that. But to be quite honest, it's easy for me to see in hindsight that that 
and I learned from it, but luckily it was on somebody else's dime. Did you have, I was about to ask, mistake. that was actually one of the questions. So like, can you share or uh, like maybe a spectacular failure that was also yeah, a great- A, a nice failure. vivid example of what you yeah. couldn't believe they were doing. <laughs> and, that, but, but oh. that, that, you know, you learned you basically that made you, you know, because I, I have to believe that in your business, you have mm. to learn, I mean, and particularly the way you're describing <laughs> the way you operate. I mean, I'm sure there has been some, some pain that, that, that gave you some nice lessons going forward. I guess it's actually, and it's something I see actually now, even though with a lot of startups, you know, if, if you're online and you're, you've got to, I always say you've got to own your brand. And uh, this one company I was involved in was very proud of themselves. They'd uh, gone and bought and they, they did a big marketing campaign. And I won't say what it was, but it was .co.uk. And they were very proud of, you know, domain name that spent a lot of the money actually in pushing out marketing when they launched. And they couldn't understand why nobody was coming to their site. And what they found out very quickly was that some smart ass had gone and bought the .com domain name, which they never thought about getting. So it doesn't matter that all of the marketing was .co.uk. At that time, and even at this time, people automatically put in .com. Right. So all the traffic they were, they were, they were getting was being diverted to their competitor. And, but what amazes me now is I still, when I talk to a lot of startups and I'm like, okay, do you own your domain? You know, if you're an online business, do you own your domain name? And they'll normally come back and say, yes, we have this one website. And I was like, what about if you're one, you know, for a lot of companies now you want to expand globally. And I say, do you have like .sg or .asia or .vc or whatever it is, do you actually own all of this or do you need to own it? And it amazes me how often they don't. They might have got one or two. And I'm like, literally, for the sake of maybe 50 bucks or $100, you can go and buy up everything. So even if you're not knowing if you're going, if you're going into India or right. Indonesia or going into Europe, it doesn't harm you just to go and own it. Because if you do ever decide to do it, there's always somebody, the minute that, that they hear about your company, they will go and do that and they'll check it. And if you want to go... Uh, and you buy it from them, it's going to cost you a fortune. Whilst it could have cost you only like two to five dollars in the first place. Um, so that was so, one of the so, things. So, that really so these guys, me. they blew all their money on that. And then like, and, and this sort of ties into it because I'm fascinated. Richard actually does uh, angel investing. I don't, I don't really, I'm more of the, I'm more of the entrepreneur, the, the, yeah. the doing entrepreneur um, rather than the investing entrepreneur. Uh, so I'm just wondering, yeah, how did they, you see, so you had that situation with the, with the domain name, but when do you, is, how, do you keep plowing money? Like when do you cut, how does it work with like, do you say, no, stop, no more money? Or is it just like, how, is that it hard? Is, is that part hard? Or is that, is that, it is, is one that, of the hardest things. And I wish yeah. there, I wish there was, I mean, I've been trying to figure out what the right answer to that is for 21 years. <laughs> so if I take, for example, my first ever investment that, that I made with my brother was into a robotics company. And I must admit, I had that company written off for years. You know, I, I, it was through one thing or another, they always managed just to stay afloat. Um, 17 years later, we sold it and made a decent amount of money out of it. I mean, if you look at it as a multiple, it was a very good exit. If you look at it as an IRR, uh, sorry, <laughs> Richard, you can tell people to look those numbers up. It wasn't a very good uh, return. but. If you'd asked me three years before we exited that business, I, I was like, it's zero, it's nothing. It's just, it's, it's a zombie, it's going to die. Um, I'm not going to spend any more time with it. And then the, the tendency to have happen is I had one company, it's probably the worst ever investment I ever made. And I knew quite, you'd some, you'd normally know quite quickly. I mean, Richard, you'll probably, I don't think you'll agree with this. You normally know quite quickly after you made an investment if you've lost all your money. Like there's certain ones that you make and you're like, you're looking at yourself in a mirror kind of a month or two months later and you're like, you plonker, what have you done? You've just pissed away all that money. You must have been, you know, what kind of idiot are you? And it's not just about the money. It's about the time. Because what, what especially for angels, I think angels are worse at this than VCs. I then spend the red at like 12 to 14 months post the investment, just trying to rescue my money, try and get a few pennies out of the pound back again. 
and I was spending all my time trying to do something which I knew was going to ultimately fail. And then I didn't spend the time working with companies that were actually going to make me a lot of money. Right. So, um, uh yeah, so certainly just just to chip in an example, there's a guy called David Cleveley who you probably know who's big in Cambridge and he was doing a workshop at the business school. I did a short course at and he went to visit the new software company he'd, he'd invested in. And he, walked, he drove up and there were seven brand new Mercedes in the car park and he thought to himself, you fucking idiots. And then he looked, no, no, they're not the idiots. I'm the idiot. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, could I, how could I invest by not making it unallowed to do that and so these guys have just gone and bought lots of expensive cars on leasing <laughs> and that's that and you know it's sometimes it's the simplest things that uh, you, you people make it too complicated but moving on to something a bit more complicated about people you said it's all about people and I don't know you mentioned sport in your schooling and I'm wondering whether and you said there are different types of CEOs so it's not like there's one perfect type of CEO and I guess you must be quite competitive in a sort of slightly unconventional way that it obviously makes you happy when the things you do go right because I've just been watching your body language. But what sort of characteristics are you looking for in the in the people in terms of their interpersonal skills, in terms of their leadership, in terms of their motivation? What what really matters to you? Um, I think there's two. I think there's two parts of the story. I think one is. Um, I like knowing the the history behind the person. So um, there's an investor whose name I have totally forgotten. Um, I met many, many years ago. And he set up a small, he put, he made a lot of, a very successful entrepreneur. And he set up a, I think it was a 20 million pound fund. And the fund was to invest in people with learning disabilities and who had a criminal record. And I was like, this is a really, and I said, I understand. I said, I think I understand what you're trying to do. And I was like, but can you explain it? And he was like, look, Michael, if you can, if you can survive, and he was very badly dyslexic as well. So if you can survive the education system, come out the other side and still have the confidence to go and start up a business, then it shows that you've got a lot of tenacity and you're not frightened to actually put yourself out there because it kind of teaches you failure. It, you get you get toughened up. And he said, one of his most successful uh, investments was into somebody who uh, he met in um, probation. Um, and he had been a major drug dealer. Uh, I think it was out of Bristol, I might have somewhere. It was Bristol. And he said, the guy had never had a chance, he never had proper school, he never had a chance to, to be successful, have a proper job. He was just caught in that kind of trap. Um, but he said, if you looked at the sophistication of the business that he had set up, it showed that he was actually really smart. And he said, I just wanted to give him a chance to actually do something on the right side of the law. Then, you know, go back. Because, and again, that's the thing. There's lots of people who, you know, we talk about, I think, quite often like criminals or, or dropouts and just think it's because they don't care. They, you know, they're lazy or they just want the easy route. But quite... No, I'm not saying that's never the case, but there's there's also cases where people have never had an opportunity to do anything else. That was kind of the road they were put on, and there was no way, there was no ever give, they were never given an opportunity to get off. And and I think for me, I kind of look at uh, founders and I like, how have you got here? What's the road that you've gone on? Have you ever come across failure before? How have you overcome it? You know, again, one of my many mistakes in the early days is if anybody came to me and said, oh, I had a startup, but it failed. I would be like, yeah, no, loser, go, kind of don't want to talk to you. You know, many years later, I realized that that's a brilliant thing to have happened because somebody else has paid for that. Somebody else has paid them the MBA for startups and somebody else has paid for it. So for me, then the question normally is, is what did you learn from that experience? What have you taken from that business that didn't work and actually using it for your new business to improve the chances of success. And for me, when you ask, so it's, again, it's always about the question that you ask. I'm not looking to, for the simple answers. I'm looking at have they actually, can they clearly demonstrate they've actually sat down 
and actually really analyzed and really thought, you know, not blamed everybody else. Like the, the easy answer, oh, my co-founder was shit or the economy turned. That startup life, that's not, you know, it's, it, I would like to say, well, I picked my founder because he's my best mate. And I realized actually that for a co-founder, I need somebody X and Y because my strength for this, and I need somebody to cover my strength. So I'm now not looking for somebody that is my best friend. I'm looking for somebody who can work with this or, you know, I didn't get product market fit. Why? What, did, what could you do have done better? So again, it's not like the simple answers. You really want to think, have they learned from it? I think that's because that comes from what I do is whenever I screw up, I kind of, what could I have done better? Um, uh, I don't care that they've had the failure. And then I think the, the second thing is, is cause you've got to make a decision. Cause at the stage we're at quite often companies don't have revenue quite often they don't have product. So um, it's, can you trust them with your money? And I think that, how do you do that? So, uh, the, the, you know, a very simple kind of way of not getting my money is writing to me. And I literally, I do not even joke, I get this at least once a day where somebody says, hey, dude, hey, bro, what's up? You know, and I'm like, you're reaching out to me and asking me for money and you think that's a professional way. And that just tells me how you're going to go and do a sales. You know, and it's just, it's just, so it's what is the level. So I always say every interaction that somebody has with me tells me something about you. So do you take notes in a meeting? Do you kind of follow up on a meeting and actually say what it is? Do you keep your time frames? Do you chase me if I don't deliver on something? How do you react? So sometimes I go into a meeting and I'm just an asshole. <laughs> because the reality is, is that businesses never go according, you know, uh, Kevin, you probably know this. Things never go according to plan. There are bad days. Nope. <laughs> the reality is, it's easy to be your best friend on a good day. But when things are tough, or when we do, do if you, I don't know if you have uh, raised external money, if you've got investors, you want to know how they will react when you disagree on something. Are they people who just shut down? Are they people that kind of get super aggressive? Are they people that actually listen to it and actually say, okay, yeah, maybe you're right, actually, or no, I disagree with you, X, or kind of, I always say there's a thin line between confidence and arrogance. Um, and then I think the next thing is, is can they inspire me? You know, um, as a leader, you know, uh, I think, well, uh, put it another way. Most founders will always tell you there's a talent shortage. They can't hire the people that, you know, if you're in London, there's a talent shortage. If you're in New York, there's a talent shortage. If you're in Singapore, there's a talent shortage. There is no talent shortage. There's more than enough talent in all of these cities. The problem is they're all in really good jobs that pay a lot of money. So you're, and you're always going to be competing against better funded companies that can offer more money than you. So for a fa startup founder, they've got to be vision. They've got to be leaders. They've got to be able to inspire people to say, yes, I've got this 10,000 pound a month job, but I'll come and work you for 2000 pounds because you're, I'm excited about what you're building. And it's not about playing ping pong and going for beer after work because that only does it for a short period of time. It is right. more, during even during the hard times, do these people stay and actually kind of are willing to make sacrifices because they believe so firmly in what you're building. And it, that comes down from the leadership, you oh, know, are, from the founders themselves. Those are all awesome insights. I, I'm really curious um, how you see so you, you're in Asia now. So like we, we jumped, uh, you know, you've been talking sort of about like, but why, well, basically what excites you about where you are in the land? Like what's the opportunities that you see there? What's the most exciting part? And why did you choose Asia and uh, or Singapore? And what's the most exciting thing that you're seeing now? Um, or what are you most excited about? Uh, lots of, okay. Yeah, sorry. Can I just, before you answer this, yeah. Kimon told me, Richard, stop asking multiple questions. <laughs> and now he's done it himself. Exactly. And make sure this gets on the record so we all... Yeah. Okay. So I, I think um, me moving out to Asia was my typical jump and then figure it out later. Um, uh, if you listen to my brother, who I never do, um, he says it was a midlife crisis. Um, I'd already gone to a US, so I had kind of done that before. And I'd been 
And so I made the decision in 2012 to come out to Asia. And um, so for 12 years, I've been in, in London, I've been doing angel investing, and I felt very comfortable. And I, I guess most entrepreneurs will understand this feeling is that you always want to feel challenged. You want, you know, when we first started doing it, we were pretty unique. We're very young. We're the kind of really first people to say, we're going to do this as a full-time job. We're not going to do anything else. This is 100% what our focus is. And we're going to take this, this kind of the, the model that we did of very investing in a very few companies and working with them very closely. By 2012, you know, there were huge numbers of angel investors. Um, if we stopped investing, nobody would really care and nobody would notice. Um, and uh, I, and one of our portfolio companies was like, I, we want to, we don't want to expand to the US, we want to expand to, to Asia. And they asked me the question and um, I thought this was a fantastic opportunity for me to go to Asia, which I've never really been to before. My wife of the time was from Sri Lanka. Um, but had spent some time in Singapore. So I went back to her um, and I mentioned that my idea was that I would move to, to Asia and I would commute back to London to see her and my daughter, uh, Maya. Um, to say that she wasn't overly in thrilled about being left on her own with a six month old baby, probably a bit of an understatement. Um, but she said if I was willing to take her to Asia and then she would have let me commute back to London, um, she would be okay with that. So we kind of packed up our bags and we moved. To, and Singapore, obviously, if you're looking to raise a young child for, for safety and for family and everything else, Singapore is the best place to go. Um, uh, and I went out to Singapore. I had two names. Uh, of people that I uh, could, could kind of kind of contact, um, and I landed in Singapore, and then I just kind of reached out to them, and then it was just a kind of uh, the ecosystem here is very very you know only really started in 2011, so it, it, it was probably just kind of like a one decade old um, that there were startups before, but in terms of like VCs really being set up and they're real really kind of getting traction. Um, and the more I was out here, the more I got excited about the opportunities that I was seeing, because I'm seeing a, you know, a population larger than Europe with no digital presence whatsoever. Um, in the UK and in Europe, you're, if, you're try, you're try, if you're trying to do something, you're changing it by a few kind of degrees you know, it's like, you know, there's always an incumbent and you're going up and you're just trying to kind of, you've got 650 million plus people out here where, and a lot of them don't have any digital imprint either on a consumer side or on a biz So I was always looking at enterprise side. So simple things like what we take for granted, 75% um, of, uh, uh, retailers in the region have no digital a way of taking any digital payments or any POS system. Seventy five percent. But it must be because you know, people don't use it because it's a cash based society, I guess. It's a cash, but again, you've got mobile wallets now. So again, it's so you've got, and, and that's the other thing. You've got, you know, uh, as I said, I love logistics, so uh, I've invested in a number of logistics. So I remember coming over here and I was hearing this. Uh, scary story where 60% um, of no, no 30% of goods that were bought in Indonesia at the time were never delivered. You know, forget about being delivered within seven days, just never these disappeared. Forget about returns, forget about tr track and tracing, you know, all of these things that we take for granted. Um, and I was talking to um, to, to somebody and I was saying, oh, what are you up to at the moment? She says, I'm moving, uh, I'm moving house. And I said, oh yeah, is anybody helping you? And she says, yeah, I've got about 40 people helping me. And I was like, okay, what are they carrying the stuff? Yeah, they're carrying the house and that we're, just, move, we're just moving house now to the neighboring camp. And I was like, you need 40 people for that? I mean, how does that work? And I was just being a bit slow. And so she sent me a photograph 
And literally she was moving house. They had picked up her whole house and they, she just got married and they were moving that entire house to another part of the village. And I said, so what's your address? And she says, we don't have addresses. We live in the village and everybody knows everybody else. So, and I was like, so how do you actually do, you know, e-commerce and how do you buy stuff online? And they've got their systems, but again, it's not the most efficient of, of, of systems. And as you rightly said, cash on delivery. I, when people talked about COD when I first got here, I was like, what, what are you talking about? Um, but, you know, that well, is how- I'm people... sorry, if 30% of the things aren't delivered, it can only yeah. be cash on delivery. <laughs> I mean- <laughs> yeah. Well, it, 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 yeah, but you, you've got this. I mean, the worst thing is, is that even the things that were delivered, I think it was a 60% return rate. So people would literally get stuff delivered to their door and they're like, yeah, I don't want it anymore. And what are you going to do, you, you, you know, and if you're delivering, I mean, there was, there was so much, you know, and if you look at the speed of change that's happening here. So a lot of things that we take for granted in the UK and Europe is not the same here, but in very few parts of kind of enterprise tech is something saturated. Somebody's got market dominance. So for me, and, and the way Southeast Asia is set up, it, it, it's, it's more likely to be a local player that actually gets success than it is um, a foreign player. So for example, I think one of the most classic ones is Uber. Uber came here, they got into Singapore and Malaysia and they just thought they were going to just roll. And there was nobody else here. So they, they got here and they were pretty much free reign. Um, a couple of local competitors, a company called Grab and uh, in particular, uh, launch at the, the kind of just afterwards and they absolutely kicked uber's butt into in the exchange that actually uber sold themselves to to grab even though they're a much smaller player and they raised a lot less funds obviously than, than uber uber but what they were able to do is they understood the market southeast asia is quite unique and they understood the people the market and opportunity uber was building an app for the global audience right which was not what you need in Southeast Asia. Maybe in Europe it works, but in a developing country and uh, it's not something. So they were able to, to, you know, so Uber would never accept cash. You know, Grab was right. like, well, most people don't have credit cards, we'll offer, you know, you can do cash. Simple things like that, right. very simple. Uber wasn't able to adapt. And I think you'll find that uh, across. So. I've invested in some companies in Southeast Asia. The growth rate of actual proper revenue is just astounding. Um, so, and it's attracting a lot of entrepreneurs here now because they're seeing this opportunity. And somewhere like Singapore is a global research center. So it's got a huge kind of, a lot of very smart people are coming here. And it's similar to what London is. You've got the APAC headquarters of like, Amazon, Facebook, Google, uh, uh, BitDance, a lot of the, you know, big Chinese companies, Rakuten, are all in Singapore. And also a lot of their research centers. And as you know, where London really developed and everything else is when these big companies came in, they brought in talent, they brought in training. Uh, yes, they competed for talent, but a lot of times that talent would then leave those companies to set up their own businesses. And that's exactly what you're seeing now. And they get excited when they see this just open opportunity on their doorstep. Hmm. And so, so I, I really liked what you said about the reason to leave Europe was that if you stopped doing what you did, no one would notice and no one would care. And yeah. obviously, perhaps because of this amazingly different market situation in Southeast Asia, that you can have much more impact through your investments. But in terms of the motivations, it sounds like you're doing well enough to mean that money and money is the scorecard, but you've probably got enough now that it's not actually what, I mean, may, maybe it is, but perhaps you could talk about what motivates you. Is it money? If it's not money, what is it? And how long, will, when will you stop doing what you're doing? Because, you know, your impact there will just be one of hundreds and no one will notice and no one will care. Just being divorced, so I don't have that much money. Um, uh, so, um, look, uh, I I would say I'm very much a workaholic. So, for me, 
having more money does not mean I'm suddenly going to have a Ferrari or go on nice holidays. Even my partner, she laughs whenever I say I'm going to retire and she just starts laughing at me. Um, the money aspect I want to do because it shows a sign of success. So for what I do, success is shown by the returns that you can actually make. Um, there are probably easier ways of making money. Um, as I said, Cocoon is not set up your traditional as your traditional funds. So I don't actually take a salary. We don't have a traditional management fee. You know, you, the traditional model is the two and 20, 2% management fee, 20% carry. Uh, we're a regulated funds. So we've got to do a 0.7% management fee, which goes into the cost of being a regulated fund. Uh, my partner and I do not take a salary, but we take a 25% carry. So for us, we're kind of saying, well, we, we believe that the returns will be there. And that's the, that's where we're kind of like betting on. And that kind of, makes us focus on the success of the businesses. So we're not, you know, if I wanted to take it easy, I could just take the 2%, I could keep on raising a larger and larger and larger fund. And um, I could kind of take it a little bit easier, a lot less stressful. Um, but I, I don't want to take that, uh, that, that road, really. And that's, you know, a, there's nothing wrong with taking the other road. But my, my view is, is that I love getting in the hustle and bustle. And I love investing in places that other people. So we've got an investment in Myanmar, um, even with all its political issues now, but you know, nobody else was really investing in there. And I must admit, probably nobody will be investing there for a while, but that's another story. But we've invested in kind of Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand. There's not much early stage funding there. Um, so a lot of these companies, if we weren't investing in them, it wasn't like, oh, if we, in, in London, every other person is either a VC or an entrepreneur or an angel investor and entrepreneur. There's very little early stage, like seed and pre-seed money. Uh, most of it is in Singapore. There's hardly any uh, across Southeast Asia in many of the other countries. So us actually going in there, I do really feel like we're making an impact and making a change, but I never want to be called like an impact fund because I've always, I want to make money and I'm investing in good founders with, who've got good businesses. Um, but I do feel that if we weren't, and we do a lot of education. So, and that's the other big thing is like helping support building of the ecosystem. So we run many workshops. Uh, we've, we've launched uh, last year, uh, female founders mentoring hours where we get, uh, and I think we've helped over uh, 400 female founders now link up with some of the top VCs across the region. So people, they wouldn't normally get to, to, and they have like 20 minutes with some of, you know, with investors from like Sequoia, um, GTV, you know, some of the, the big funds where they can actually sort down, sit down with some of the partners of these funds and say, I've got this problem. So it's not necessarily about fundraising. It's like giving them access to knowledge. Um, Cause like, I think in, in Europe, there is a, there is a huge shortage of female founders here. So this is the bit that we're trying to do to kind of give them access um, and give them the confidence to actually go out and fundraise and we run lots of workshops um, and everything and especially my co-founder was one of the founders of Kelku um, uh, and he's, he's as I said been investing for pretty much as long as I have and is a phenomenal uh, investor so and he comes very much from the tech background so he can sit down with a lot of founders and really help them understand how to actually build and scale their, their technology and their businesses because um, he's actually gone through it himself so I, of the two of us, I would say he's the true and pure kind of entrepreneur at heart. I have a question because so you're 20 years, you had this long experience in uh, yeah. um, being the angel in, in, in London. And now you've done it pretty, it sounds like you've done it pretty much equally, like 10 years here, 10 years or whatever. It's just pretty yeah. a significant amount of time in both places. I'm just wondering culturally, the entrepreneurs themselves, how is it different? Like, how are they different? Are they, are, are they, how are the Asian entrepreneurs different from the, from the European or UK ones? I would be, I would be very careful. I don't, don't. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Don't worry about offending us. Don't, don't, you can, and, and <laughs> I, I've, I've got a thick skin. It's the entrepreneurs. It's, it's the entrepreneurs. I always, I always get myself into trouble. I think there's, uh, for a lot of entrepreneurs in, that I, I meet in the UK, there's a huge amount of, you should be honored that we're talking to you. you know, we're entrepreneurs, you should kind of like, uh, you know, there's a level of expectation. 
Um, but also there's a level of knowledge there as well. So the ecosystem is much older. I think there's a lot more kind of multiple founders, like serial founders that have gone through it a number of times. And there's actually a lot of sharing of knowledge. So one of the things I love about uh, London is that I found that founders are always willing to share their learnings. They're willing to talk about the good and the bad and help other, help other founders. And I think the... In, in Asia, um, the ecosystem is much younger and there's not that level of sharing, but the hunger for the, of the founders is they're just, they just want somebody to give them a chance and they're willing to do whatever it takes. They're not into the lifestyle. For them, this could, this could be a life-changing uh, opportunity, not just for them, but for their family and their friends. But there's also an, an inherent about backdrop of fear of failure. So, you know, because it's about you know if you do a startup it's not just about you especially you know if you've got if somebody has have been lucky and they've got you know they've got an education their families might have had to give up a lot for their kids to have an education and then there's an expectation they'll become the lawyer the doctor uh the right. banker the consultant this. and then all of a sudden you say actually no i'm gonna go and do i'm gonna do a startup <laughs> and they're like you know we never want to you know it's literally you know that's not what we made all these sacrifices for and if they failed and go back home it's not just a failure on the individual it's on the whole family as well that's interesting i'm wondering i didn't when i'm listening to you talking it just comes full circle like you were talking about hardship like and i think you were talking about another investor but it sounds like you also sort of aligned with that thinking that investing in people that came through hardship whether it was dyslexia yeah. or whether it was somebody who had a criminal record and i'm just wondering if it, that's not what draws you to asia is maybe some of these people have had just tougher stories basically to get so that they're as you said somehow maybe more appreciative of the opportunity or, or just really going to as you said they're going to give it like some the extra 10% or whatever it is that you're going to get. Yeah, I, I, I'm definitely attracted to founders who've gone through hardships or had to really fight to get to where they are now. But I would say that would be the same. I, I literally think it is, is that the ecosystem here needs love, a lot of love and support, like it did in the early days in the UK. Um, and, you know, there, there were times when I first got here, I was seeing founders mm who were coming to me to raise their seed funding. And they're like, yeah, we took like $100,000 of, you know, Joe blogs, and I've, he's now got 60% of his, my business. You know, because they didn't know any better. And right. there wasn't that much money. And, and, you know, obviously, it makes me very angry when I hear kind of stories like that. And I want to kind of in my way, make sure that you set a you set standards and you help educate people to understand what is the right way of doing things what is the wrong way of doing things um and even if i don't invest in companies it doesn't mean i don't want them to be successful you know um and to be quite honest many times they go on to be extremely successful um and it's for me it's enough to knowing that i might have given a good word of advice or given a pat on the back to a family to help them take that next step um, even if I don't get rewarded by it because I haven't put any right. money behind it. Um, and for me, I just, you know, I'm, I'm excited about getting up every morning and going to work, even if I'm dealing with 10 fires because I love solving problems and the founders on the whole. It doesn't mean that I don't have bad days or that I don't, there's not founders that, to be honest, I just don't like anymore because they, they, you know, for one reason or another, it's not because they necessarily disagree with me. It's normally because they haven't put the effort in or that they've, they've gone towards, they've crossed the line of confidence into arrogance. Um, and you know, they're doing wrong and they just won't listen to not right. just you, but anybody around them. Um, and it gets frustrating. Um, so I think for me, it's, you know, I guess, Richard, your point, like, why do I get up and do this every day? I've been doing it for 20 years. I just get excited about seeing how people are trying to change the world. Founders on the whole are not normal people. That they have, that, that there's, that, that they, they have this risk taking. And there's, that I would call them, there's lots of entrepreneurs and there's lots of fake entrepreneurs. I think there's, 
you know, in the good times, there's a lot of fake, like people think, oh, it's just easy. I just go and do a startup. And really the minute it gets hard, they're like, okay, actually, I'm going to go back to my real job. So I'm talking about the, the kind of real, just the passion that they have. Um, and if you feel that you can make a change and that you're being a part of it and involved, and even as an investor, like, you know, obviously we don't do the work that the founders do. For me, that's, that's the joy that I get. And I feel that I can do that much more in Southeast Asia than, than in the UK. I still invest in the UK, but to be quite honest, I let my brother do all the investing. Um, I don't really meet the founders. I don't really get involved in that uh, anymore. If you ask me what my last five investments in the UK were, um, I would be like, let me call my brother. Um, <laughs> but uh, in terms of Asia, I, you know, I can name all my companies, all my founders. Uh, uh, and I get excited about what they're trying to do. And for some companies, you know, we've got one company that is trying to bank the unbanked in Indonesia. They've already helped thousands of people actually build a credit history, which then allows them to do many other things. And I'm sitting there thinking, A, I'm going to make a lot of money. But B, I'm actually helping a lot of people. But, you know, still, you, I, I, don't, I don't want to just help a lot of people and not make any money because that's not sustainable. But, right. you know, you, for, for me, if you can have that win-win situation where you can make money and actually do a lot of good, um, for me, that's the kind of, you know, the perfect way to help me get a, get a good night's sleep. Yeah, I, we're getting towards the end of our, our time. It's all very interesting, but for, obviously people can look it up on the web, but could you just give a sense of the scale of the fund, like approximately how much money you put in the range and what sort of percentage shareholding you like to take? Because I'm sure some listeners are running right now and they're not going right, to be able yeah. to go and look you up. Right. right. Yeah, and, so, yeah, and also, how, what's the best way for them to see? Because I think that people might like want to get in touch with you or your brother. Um, so. Okay, so um, I'll talk about uh, Cocoon Capital, uh, which is the one based in Singapore. So we've currently got a, uh, I think it's 23 million USD fund. Uh, we invest anywhere between half a million and a million dollars into kind of, ed, you know, deep tech and enterprise tech companies, um, which are based in Southeast Asia. Um, we like being the first money in. We're always lead investor. Um, and quite often we like taking the whole round ourselves um, because of the amount of work. As I said, we only on we only do about five deals a year with a team of eight. Um, over fifty percent of our time is working with companies post investment. So um, uh, and we can we can also follow on, but our focus is on that first two years post investment. Um, in in the UK, it's even more development, and so. Yeah, so I'll just finish off with Cocoon Capital, actually. So if you want to send us an email, uh, you can either look me up on LinkedIn or you can go to uh, cocooncap.com and we, we only accept online uh, applications for funding. And don't start uh, it Hey, don't start it with, hey, dude. <laughs> no, none of that, please. No, God, no. Please, thank you, Richard. Yeah, just don't. don't. <laughs> uh, you know, just, just remember, this is just a tip for any entrepreneur. The most important document for your fundraising is not actually your investor deck. It's your cover email, your cover letter. You know, you've got to get them to open it. And if you look to a lot of investors, they get over two, 3,000 uh, pitches a year in their inbox. You'll be amazed how many of them don't even open up the attachment because they don't get excited about the, just from the cover email. So the cover email, three, three paragraphs to get them excited. That's just my one little tip. Uh, in the UK, it's avonmoredevelopments.com. My brother has a sixth sense of humor, so he wanted to give me a very long email address that I, even 21 years later, still struggle sometimes to spell correctly. Um, so uh, on there, you can either apply online. Again, uh, it's probably easiest to either reach out to my brother, Simon uh, Blakey, or myself uh, on LinkedIn and just send us your deck or reach out to us that way. That's probably the... Uh, the easiest way to reach us there. And we'll invest in any UK-based businesses there. Again, seed, and again, mostly focusing on enterprise and deep tech. Cool. So I guess, Richard, you can put that in the show. You can maybe put some of this info in the show notes so sure. that people can see it. All right. So uh, thanks so much for doing this with us. It's been... Uh, also, it is uh, it is late where you are, so we appreciate you staying up staying up late uh, or, or sorry for interrupting your American uh, UK business hour. UK, no, no. 
I'll, I'll, I'll call my better half now and, and she'll be wondering <laughs> what the hell I'm doing up at this point in time. Uh, but no, no, it's been but, an absolute pleasure. Uh, always yeah, I mean, because really fascinating story. I mean, I love the I love the, the roots um, from the illegal house parties or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> To, uh, to 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 being this uh, you know venture capitalist basically and having and but doing it in sounds like you're doing it in a really um, also socially conscious way and 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 you're, and you're just heavily involved so I mean like I thought a very uh, it's a very interesting story and very uh, you know it's motivating for I think for a lot of people to hear so thanks so much for that my pleasure thanks again for having me on uh, on this I've really really enjoyed it and all the best yeah, to you both couple more thank yous. Okay that we want to give out uh obviously thanks so much to the listeners the people for uh for listening to this um the production that we do uh, you'll see we have a really nice uh post-production that goes on here we have a youtube channel uh, my daughter magda fontakidis is the actually does the graphic design and the video editing um she does the teaser as well which you'll see when we, when we put it out we've got a super intern magda buiskos she's actually a high school student and she's a super entrepreneurial uh, young lady, and she does the PR and promotion for us. Um, and then, of course, the team at MBN that does the uh, that does all the technical support that gets this podcast up there. Um, so, yeah, if you if you're listening and you like this, uh, subscribe uh, at MBN YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. And uh, of course, if you really liked it, like it, comment it, and share it. Thank you. The podcast is over.